Hello and welcome to this lecture on LearnOBGYN.com. Today's topic is Introduction to Obstetrics. We will review some basic topics and background on the OB series before delving into more complex lectures with different videos later on. Let's begin with the topic of gestational age. In order to calculate the gestational age, it is important that we know a patient's LMP, or last menstrual period. When we're talking about LMP, especially when it comes to obstetrics, what we specifically want to know is the, the first day of their last menstrual period. Um, not the last day, not the general time, but the first day of their last menstrual period. Because this is what we'll be using to calculate their due date and gestational age. So the gestational age is the number of days since their LMP. And again, this is the, the first day of their LMP. And the way that's typically stated is in terms of weeks and then days. So for example, you'll say this patient has a gestational age of eight weeks and six days. This can be written in different formats as well. Sometimes people write 8.6. Sometimes you'll see eight to the power of six. You could see eight and six sevenths. But in general, the principle is the same. The first number will be the number of weeks. The second number will be the number of days. The EDD, sometimes also called the EDC, is the estimated date of delivery or estimated date of confinement. And this is their due date. So it is 280 days after the first day of their LMP. And this is equal to 40 weeks and zero days. And again, this is their due date. Sometimes patients will incorrectly interpret their gestational age, especially when they try to go back in time and try to figure out what day corresponds with zero weeks and zero days in an attempt to figure out the date of conception. But as we know, zero weeks, zero days is actually the date of the first day of the period and not the date of conception. For people who have regular cycles, and we define regular cycles as 28 days. So for these people, they're usually ovulating around day 14. So the date of conception is actually sometime around day 14. I've actually had multiple patients who have been very concerned or confused about this because they've had multiple partners around the date of conception. And the person they had sex with on day zero may have been different than the person they had sex with on day 14. So if your patients are confused about this topic, you can educate them that this is actually based off their LMP and not the date of conception. Now let's talk about trimesters and terms. So a pregnancy is divided into three trimesters. Each of them are 14 weeks long. Um, so the first trimester is between zero and 14 weeks. The second trimester covers 14 to 28 weeks. And the third trimester covers from 28 weeks on to delivery. A helpful way to remember how many weeks are in each trimester is to remember the fact that a person's due date corresponds with 40 weeks and zero days. So if you divide this by three for number of trimesters, you'll get 13.33. And since that doesn't correspond to an equal number, just round up and that gets you 14. Now let's talk about certain landmarks and time points within the trimesters. The first one we'll talk about is viability. So viability is the earliest gestational age in which the NICU will provide resuscitation for a fetus because this is the earliest a fetus has any chance of living outside the uterus. The typical cutoff you'll see in most of your textbooks is 24 weeks. But now because of more modern medicine, we are delivering fetuses as early as 23 weeks and in some institutions even earlier. So for your purposes, 23 weeks or 24 weeks would be an acceptable answer for viability. Next, we'll talk about preterm. So preterm corresponds from everything up until when a fetus is viable to 36 and six weeks. A fetus is considered full term after 37 weeks and up until 42 weeks. And anything after 42 weeks is considered 
post term. So remember, the due date corresponds to this time here, 40 weeks and zero days. If someone is born at 37 weeks or 38 weeks, even though it's before their due date, they're still considered full term because it is in this range of 37 to 42. Now let's talk about how we calculate a person's due date. So as we mentioned before, someone's due date is 280 days after the first day of their last menstrual period. And again, this really only corresponds to people who A, remember when their last menstrual period was, and B, who have normal and regular cycles. And remember, that's 28 days. So if someone has a cycle of 24, 26 days, that can be okay. But if they have irregular periods, for example, every two or three months, and they have spotting versus actual periods, we really wouldn't use their LMP as the calculation for their due date. If you want to calculate someone's due date using simple arithmetic in your head, you can use something called Nagel's rule. So for Nagel's rule, you take the date of their LMP, and then you're going to subtract three months, and then add seven days, and add one year, and that will give you their due date. If someone says their LMP is 4, 11, 2019. So using Nagel's rule, let's subtract three months. That'll give us January. And add seven days, the 18th. And then add one year, 20. So their due date will equal January 18th, 2020. I find it's a little bit easier instead of adding and subtracting things to just add nine months and seven days and it'll give you the same due date as well. So let's try this one more time. So four plus nine is 13, but since there are only 12 months in a year, instead of saying 13, we'll just rotate over and go back to one and add seven days. So again, that'll be 18. And then add a year because we rounded over. So that becomes 20. So calculating someone's due date, you could just simply add nine months and seven days to the date of their LMP to get their due date. Or you can do what I do, which is just put in the computer or in an app on your phone, and that'll give you a more accurate number. You probably already know that the LMP is not the only way to get a due date. It can be either acquired via their LMP or by ultrasound. The question is, which one is better and when to use each one? Sometimes the answer is easy, especially when the patient doesn't know their LMP or if they have irregular cycles. But when they don't, then you should use the following rules. Earlier ultrasounds are more accurate at calculating a person's due date. If there are ever any discrepancies between an earlier and a later ultrasound, you should always use the earlier ultrasound for dating. This also applies if someone has a due date that's based off of their LMP, consistent with an early ultrasound, and if later you have another ultrasound that's different, you should not change their due date based off the second ultrasound. General rule of thumb is, if the discrepancy is more than seven days times a trimester, use the dating from the ultrasound. So what that means is in the first trimester, if there's a discrepancy more than seven days, for example, the ultrasound gives you a due date that is nine days earlier or later than the LMP, then you'll use the ultrasound. Otherwise, you should use the LMP dating. In the second trimester, two times seven is 14, so if the discrepancy is more than 14 days, then use the ultrasound. If it's less than 14 days, use the dating based off of the LMP. And in the third trimester, three times seven is 21, so if the discrepancy is more than 21 days, then you'll use the ultrasound dating if it's less than 21 days, use the dating based off the LMP. So remember what I said before that that was just a rule of thumb. There's actually more specific criteria that can break it down a little bit further that tells you when you want to use certain um, ultrasound dating versus LMP dating. And it's displayed in front of you right now. I don't recommend remembering each of these cutoffs. 
And what I recommend is sticking with the trimester rule, except for if you had to remember one, I just remember if it's less than nine days, use a five day discrepancy. Otherwise, I would stick with the seven days in the first trimester, 14 days in the second trimester, and 21 days in the third trimester. Let's go over a few examples to get it right now. So let's say you have a patient who has a gestational age of eight weeks, zero days, based off her last menstrual period. And then on that day, you do an ultrasound that shows a fetus which is measuring 14 weeks, zero days. The difference between these two is 42 days. So obviously we're going to go with the dating that's based off of the ultrasound because that's way above any of the discrepancies we mentioned here. Let's talk about another patient who thinks her gestational age based off her LMP is nine weeks, two days. On that day, we do an ultrasound and the fetus measures 10 weeks, one day. So the difference here is six days. Because we are in the first trimester, our cutoff is seven days. This is less than that cutoff. So we will be using the dating based off the patient's LMP. Now we have someone who thinks her gestational age is six weeks, three days by her LMP. We do an ultrasound that shows seven weeks, four days. This difference in discrepancy is eight days. Because this is more than that seven day cutoff, we'll be using the due date that's based off our ultrasound. Now, how about someone who is 16 weeks and two days by her LMP? On that day, she has an ultrasound that shows a fetus that's measuring 17 weeks and four days. So the difference between these two calculates to nine days. So which of these two should we be using to establish her dating by? In this case, we're actually going to be using the dating based off of our LMP. Because even though this is more than seven days, 16 weeks is actually in the second trimester. So in the second trimester, we are using 14 days to establish our cutoffs. Now let's talk about one more situation. Let's review our friend over here. She had an ultrasound when she was nine weeks, two days, that said the fetus measured 10 weeks, one day. We already previously established that we would be using the dating based off her LMP. Now let's say she has another ultrasound, which she does when she is at 20 weeks and four days. On this day, she has an ultrasound that puts the fetus at 22 weeks and five days. The difference between these two dates is now 15 days. So what should we use to establish her due date? This is actually a trick question. Even though this discrepancy is more than our 14 day cutoff for the second trimester, this patient already has an established due date based off of her LMP that is consistent with an early ultrasound. So we do not change a patient's due date based off of a second ultrasound. Remember, ultrasounds are less accurate the further along you are in the pregnancy. We do not change a due date once it has been established based off of an LMP, especially if it's consistent with an early ultrasound. Now let's briefly touch upon how we use ultrasounds to calculate due dates. This is more of a practical skill and I don't want you to worry about knowing how to do the actual measurements yourself, just to get a basic idea of what is being measured. In the first trimester, what we measure is the crown rump length, which is abbreviated as CRL. This is exactly what it sounds like, which is a measurement of the length between the crown or the top of the head and the rump or the bottom of a early fetus and it's measured as a straight line. 
This is called the crown rump length. In the second and third trimester, or basically anything besides the first trimester, there are four components that are measured, and they are put in a formula that gives you an estimated fetal weight and also the gestational age. These measurements include the biparietal diameter, the head circumference, the abdominal circumference, and the femur length. Here are some pictures that go over these measurements a little bit. And again, I don't want you to worry about knowing the practical skills, but just to get a general idea of what these are. The biparietal diameter is shown in this picture here. It is a measurement from the outer edge of the skull to the inner edge of the contralateral side of the skull. To get a basic idea of where it is, it's just measuring from the temple of one side of the head to the temple of the other side. So in this drawing, it'll be from here to here, and this is a diameter, so it's a straight line across. One noteworthy thing is when you measure it, since the skull here is not a narrow line and has um, some thickness to it, what you're actually measuring from is the outer edge on the top side to the inner edge on the bottom side. Again, please do not worry about the technical skills of measuring, but this is something that you may get pimped on, but not really tested on on your boards. The head circumference is a circumference around the skull, and this is measured on the outer edge of the skull. Then you have the abdominal circumference in this picture here. Just to review a few landmarks, you may see the ribs here and here, vertebra over here, a little stomach bubble here. Although not clearly seen here, you'd want to see the umbilical vein here, which is connected to a portal sinus by a liver. And since this is an abdominal circumference, what's being measured is the circle around the abdomen. And then finally, this picture down here shows a femur length. And this one's the most basic and actually the easiest to measure. It is just a straight line measuring the length of the femur. Now let's talk about gravidity and parity. This is a topic that can be confusing at first because there's so many different numbers and there's different scenarios where these numbers could be changed slightly. But if you break it down, it's actually quite simple. Gravidity refers to the number of times a patient was ever pregnant. If the patient is currently pregnant, it also includes that current pregnancy. Keep in mind that this does not refer to the number of fetuses. So it does not matter if the patient had twins or triplets, quadruplets. It just refers to the number of times she was pregnant. So a patient who was pregnant for twins one time and a patient who was pregnant for triplets one time, they are both G1. So they were pregnant one time despite the number of children they had. Now let's talk about parity. Parity can be further broken down into four subsets, term, preterm, abortions, and living. When talking about parity and the subsets, they are always referred to in that specific order. So you can try to remember the acronym TPAL to help remember the order that you're going to present these when talking about parity. When it comes to term, term includes the number of times a patient was able to complete a pregnancy or stay pregnant until 37 weeks. Again, this does not include the number of fetuses, so it does not matter if they had twins, triplets, or any other multiples. It just refers to the number of pregnancies itself. Preterm refers to the number of times a patient was able to stay pregnant but delivered or ended the pregnancy between 20 weeks and 37 weeks. What's a little bit confusing about this is because if you remember back to viability, we say viability is 24 weeks. This is a different number than 20. Um, so do not confuse viability with the cutoff for preterm. This is just simply 40 divided by two is 20. This is the number of times a patient was pregnant and remained pregnant 
until 20 weeks to 37 weeks. It does not matter what happened with those pregnancies, whether they were preterm labor, whether they were preterm labor that went on to have a baby that lived, where they were an abortion late, for example, like a 21 week abortion. This is just the number of times a patient was pregnant and the pregnancy stopped between this time. Next is abortions. So this is the number of times a patient was pregnant and their pregnancy ended for 20 weeks. This includes both spontaneous abortions and therapeutic abortions. A therapeutic abortion is an abortion a patient chooses to have either medically or with a procedure such as a DNC or DNE. And a spontaneous abortion is an abortion that occurs naturally or that is not iatrogenic. And then finally, living. So this is the number of living children the patient currently has. So this is when we finally start to be concerned about twins, triplets, or other multiples. So if a patient was pregnant one time and had twins, the number for this would actually be two and not one. When describing this either in your verbal reports or in your notes, the way this is presented is G number, then P, and then you'd say the numbers for T, P, A, L, or a shorthand version, especially if you're talking about more of a GYN patient, is just the G number and then P and just the number of living children. So a quick example, a patient who was pregnant only one time, delivered a full term pregnancy, will be a G1, P1001, or a G1, P1 for shorthand. So to review this, this is one pregnancy. Her T is one because she had one full term delivery. The P is zero because there was no preterm deliveries no abortions, and one living child. And in the shorthand version, pregnant once and has one living child. Now let's do a few examples together. Veronica is a 25-year-old with the following history. She's had one NSVD. NSVD stands for Normal Spontaneous Vaginal Delivery. And this delivery was at 38 weeks in six days. She is not currently pregnant. So what would her G's and P's be? I recommend at this time pausing the video and trying to answer this by yourself to make sure you clearly understand the material before going on. So for Veronica, she was only pregnant one time, so she is a G1. She had one term delivery, zero preterm deliveries, zero abortions, and she has one living child. So she is a G1, P1001, and you can also call that a G1, P1 for shorthand. For our next example, Stephanie is a 29-year-old who's had one tab or a therapeutic abortion with DNC. This is a dilation and curatage or a procedure that is used for abortions, and this was done at eight weeks. She is also currently pregnant. So what are her G's and P's? So for her gravidity, she has been pregnant two times because she has her previous abortion and she's currently pregnant. And for her P's, she has had zero full-term deliveries. She has had zero preterm deliveries she had one abortion and she has zero living children. So she is a G2 P0010. If you wanted to abbreviate this one, you would make it into a G2 P0. However, we typically do not abbreviate in this fashion when they are currently pregnant. Again, the abbreviations are more useful when talking about a GYN patient as opposed to an OB patient. Now let's talk about this next example. Karen is a 32 year old who has been pregnant and she has had one NSVD 
at 38 weeks. She had an SVD. We're calling this a spontaneous vaginal delivery as opposed to a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery because it was preterm and therefore it's not considered normal. At 36 weeks for twins. She had a therapeutic abortion with a dilation and curettage at 16 weeks and she's currently pregnant. So this one is considerably harder than the last two. Take some time to think about it. What are her G's and P's? So let's start off her gravidity. She has been pregnant three times previously and is also currently pregnant. So she is a G4. She has had one term delivery. Her only her first one was term. So she is a P1. She had had one preterm delivery. So another one. And even though she had twins for her preterm delivery, this is just the number of times she was pregnant and delivered preterm. So that's why this is a one and not a two. She had one abortion and then number of living children. She has had one living child from her first pregnancy and then two from her second pregnancy, zero from her third. And we don't count the current one. So she, the last number here is a three. So she is a G4 P1113, and that could be abbreviated as a G4 P3. But again, we do not abbreviate when they are currently pregnant. And this will be our last example. Samantha is a 21 year old who had one tab at 22 weeks, and she is not currently pregnant. What are her G's and P's? So she is a G1. She was pregnant one time total. She is a P. She had zero full-term deliveries. For her preterm deliveries, and remember, a preterm delivery is considered a pregnancy that ends between 20 and 37 weeks. So her P is actually a 1. And then we're going to say 0 for the third number and again 0 for the last number because she has no living children. So Samantha is a G1 P0100 and that abbreviates to a G1 P0. This final slide will go over a few words that we'll be using to describe patients typically on the labor and delivery floor based off how many times they've been pregnant. A nulliparous patient, also called a nullip, is a patient who has never given birth, and typically it's used to describe a patient who has never been pregnant. So typically this is a G0. A prima gravida, also called a primip, is typically used to describe a patient who's pregnant for the first time. So this is usually a G1, P0. Sometimes we can also call people an essential primip, especially on the labor and delivery floor, is if they've had pregnancies before, had abortions, but have never had any vaginal deliveries. So for example, a G2, P0010, is someone who has had an abortion but has never had any vaginal deliveries or c-sections so sometimes we call these patients essential primips but for your purposes in your head a primip should always be a g1 p0 a multigravida also called a multip and typically this refers to people who have had at least one delivery so for example a g 3 P2002 zero, zero, two, is considered a multip because she's been pregnant three times and has had two full term deliveries. It does not matter what their mode of delivery was, whether it be C section or vaginal delivery, they are still considered a multip. And finally, a grand multip is someone who has given birth at least five times. The reason we give these 
patient specific names is because by being a grand multip, they are at higher risk for certain conditions. In particular, one that pops up to your mind should be a postpartum hemorrhage. But for your purposes, just remember a grand multip has given birth, not just been pregnant, but given birth five times. If there are any errors, I'll try to add notes or commentary to this section on the YouTube video. And for additional reading, please check out these articles. That's all for this lecture. Thank you for listening.